Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, we're going to talk again about a real life scenario and how it can uh, help educate us. The real life scenario is this one right here. Now, this is not an isolated incident. and We've seen a lot of this. Um, and it has to do with what happens when cars get surrounded by angry mobs. Now, this is a really common question. I get this question at every single basic self-defense law class I teach, third Wednesday of every month at Security Gun Club. If you guys want to join us, uh, I get this question. And the answer is a lot more complicated than you may think and will also depend greatly on what jurisdiction you may reside in. But today, let's try to get some general rules out, give you some food for thought, and let's talk about what can you do if a mob surrounds your car? Okay, so here's what we're talking about today. A scenario where you're just driving along, minding your own business, and the next thing you know, you have driven near or accidentally into a protest and you are now surrounded by an angry mob. How could that ever happen, you say? Well, if you go back in our time machine to the summer of 2021, anywhere in Seattle or Portland, it could happen at any moment. You could literally be driving right by the downtown Nordstrom's in downtown Seattle, hang a left on Pine Street, and suddenly, oh my God, you're in the middle of an Antifa uh, rally. So um, this is a real, true, honest scenario. And as we know, it's been happening because in the exercise of everyone's First Amendment uh, rights, we have a group of individuals throughout the nation, mostly college students, by the way, who want to go out and support a terrorist organization such as Hamas. But we're beginning to see incidents like this unfold. So let's watch the tape here. Okay, and then if you notice, the driver gets out of the initial mob, but gets down to another intersection, and then there's video of what occurs down there. So take a look at this. Motherfuckers, where you going now? He not going nowhere now. He not going nowhere now. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. He not going nowhere now. He not going nowhere now. Okay, so the scenario is, what can you do if, God forbid, you are in your car, which is suddenly surrounded by an angry mob? Before we can get to the answers, let's get the basic ground rules down. Now, I'm going to use Washington law because this is Washington gun law, and it's the one I know off the top of my head. I have geeked out 
on self-defense laws all around the nation. And with a few exceptions, this is going to be generally consistent with what occurs in your state. However, and the caveat I always give is, please consult with local counsel because every local law could have a nuance that could change the factual scenario. Now, here we go. What we know, self-defense in general, okay, is that we can use force to defend ourselves so long as the force we use is necessary reasonable, both objectively and subjectively, and proportional. We also know that we cannot use lethal force unless, one, you are in imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Two, someone else in your presence is in imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Three, a felony is being committed upon your person. Or four, a felony is being committed inside your home. And then finally, since we're not going to be talking about using a firearm or anything like this, we are talking about driving away, but arguably and possibly driving into or over individuals. So we need to define what is considered deadly force. In most jurisdictions, deadly force is defined as deadly force means the intentional application of force through the use of firearms or any other means reasonably likely to cause death or serious physical injury. Okay, so like I've always taught before, anytime we're using a firearm, that will always be analyzed under the use of deadly force. There are other inanimate objects, however, not designed to be deadly weapons, but if used that way, are very effective. The kitchen knife, the baseball bat, and yes, the automobile. And so what we need to understand is if we are surrounded by an angry mob, and we decide to just step on the gas and get out of there. Any reasonable person would understand that that could result in serious physical injury or death to other people. So knowing that that may be the case, when, if ever, can it be lawfully justified? Okay, so now that we got the general rules of self-defense, now that we got the general rules of when we get to use lethal force, now that we understand what lethal force is, let us also remember that when it comes to defense of property and property only, we are normally, with a very few exceptions, we are normally not permitted to use lethal force to defend only property. And the reason, of course, is, is that if you go back and look at the four ways in which you can typically use lethal force, it requires that a human being be in imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. So even though you may want to shoot the people who are beating the hell out of your car, you probably do not have the right to do so. So, Here's the general rule here, okay? If you get surrounded by an angry mob and they're just pounding on the car and nothing more, are they damaging the car? They most definitely are. Do you have the right to use reasonable force to defend your property? Yes, you do. Would be getting out of the car part of that reasonable force? I think that honestly, if you talk to the tactical people, they'll tell you that's the worst thing you can do. You are stepping into an angry mob where you are clearly outnumbered. Could you drive forward in a slow, methodical manner, understanding that that may cause infliction of greater damage to the car, but could you drive in a slower manner, thus no way endangering anyone from being run over until you were in a safe location? Yes, that would be not only an attempt to retreat, which you are under no duty to retreat in most states. Again, check with your local jurisdictions because some states actually do require you to retreat. But if you're in an automobile, there's really only one way to retreat and that's actually to drive away. So if we're just talking about pounding on the car, we cannot be using lethal force because we are only defending property. Now, when the windows start getting smashed out, we're getting to a different point now because now we got glass flying and we obviously have objects that are flying in through the windshields in order to break them, okay? This does begin to create a significant risk of death or certainly serious bodily injury. And anyone who's ever known who's gotten glass into their eyes or anything like that, that can result in significant and permanent injury. At this point, at this point now, also another argument could be made that, hey, if they're smashing out the windows, what's next? They're gonna probably try to reach in and get me. 
So at this point, driving away in a more rapid fashion could be legally justified, again, based upon your jurisdiction. Now, if we've gotten through, the car's been smashed on, the windows have been smashed out, and they're reaching in the car to pull you out of the car, that's a whole different story, okay? All bets are off at that point, okay? You absolutely are an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, and you are absolutely having a felony committed upon your person. It is a carjacking, it is a robbery, it is a felony assault, it's probably all of the above. And let us remember that if there are other individuals in the car, passengers, children, whoever, okay, then you have other people in your presence, which are also now in imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. But this is where it's going to get a little trickier for you. And this is why there is that old adage, it's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six. And there may be some truth to it. But understand this, a jury's going to have to find that your use of force was reasonable both subjectively and objectively. And let me explain the difference. Subjectively, a jury's going to be told, hey, just put yourself in that driver's shoes. Know what they know, see what they see, hear what they hear. Would you have done the same thing? If the answer is yes, they also have to determine, however, that the use of force was objectively reasonable. That is, we as a society are willing to accept that. So, in certain jurisdictions, depending on the makeup of your jury, even if they subjectively believe that you have the right to use force, they may not be big fans of you plowing over protesters that might be of a similar political leaning. For this gentleman here, as we go back and we take a look, uh, at first, I actually thought that he himself was getting pulled out of the car. And at that point, I really felt like, hey, he probably could have just taken off. But as it turns out, upon further review, it appears that he himself got out of the car. Bad idea. And I think when he got himself out of the car, he also ultimately ended up getting himself pepper sprayed. Because when we take a look at video number two here, he clearly is at least exhibiting some signs of having some pepper spray or some mace or something like that having been used on him. Now, in both instances, however... With mob number one and mob number two, it appears that the car is being smashed on, and so the use of lethal force is likely not justified here. But at no point, at no point does this gentleman use lethal force. He pulls away from the first mob in a relatively calm fashion until he gets open roadway and then he gets out of there quickly which he should do and then when the second mob again kind of surrounds him at the next intersection he again makes a u-turn right here he does so in a pretty safe manner he makes sure that nobody's in front of him he never strikes a motorist there are plenty of them who try to strike him but he never strikes a single motorist and i get that all of these people out there who wanted to go out and support a terrorist organization like hamas are saying, you know, get his plate, get his plate, get his plate, and call the police, call the police. And honestly, I don't think this gentleman has done anything illegal at all. This is an actual pretty measured response. I'm sure the car is completely messed up, but I think this uh, gentleman actually showed great restraint. The moral of the story is, if it's only the car that's being pounded on, you cannot use lethal force. If the windows start getting smashed out, we're probably getting to a point where you may need to. And if they're reaching and trying to pull you or any other occupant of the vehicle out, at that point, yeah, all bets are off. You need to start saving your life and anyone else's in your vehicle. Listen, we'll link up the statutes that apply here in Washington State. So if you guys want to geek out on that, you can do so. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is down in the description box. Also, in the meantime, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.